Coming up 18 North, and also from Birds of Chicago, who perform at WOJV Park Center concert April 3rd, of course, at the Park Theater, Park Center in Hayward. And before that, we uh, had a little uh, caffeine with uh, Patty Larkin, which we're doing right now. And who are we? I am Eric Schubring, and sitting along alongside me is Paul Levine. Paul, welcome. Good morning, Eric. Good day to see you. Today is a huge day electorally all across the country. There are how many primary elections on this Super Tuesday? Yeah. No, that's even more than that. I believe it's 14 oh states God. that are up. Uh, 1,357 delegates in total. California, Texas, North Carolina, Virginia, Massachusetts, Minnesota. You want to watch that, our next door neighbor, what happens there today. Colorado, Tennessee, Alabama, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Utah. Maine, Vermont, American Samoa has six delegates being voted, and they start the at-large uh, Democratic abroad vote, which is six delegates as well. So a total of uh, a total of, jeez, uh, I, I lost the number here. 1,991. 1,357 for Super Tuesday out of 3,979 in total. And you need 1,991 to win. So there's, uh, you know, there's, there's a third of the delegates here that are going to happen today across the United States. There's been changes just in the last couple of days. Uh, 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 Cloture, the Minnesota Senator, and he said we should keep an eye on Minnesota. Uh, what's happening next door? What impact that has on what? <laughs> it's hard to. Well, hard to sort it out. And Pete Buttigieg, he, he dropped out. He dropped out, and right after that, Kobachar uh, yeah. dropped out, both uh, endorsing uh, Biden, which means that their delegates, their delegates, now go to Biden in the pledge uh, to uh, uh, in the through the endorsement process. Well, that's uh, a part of the endorsement process. Of endorsement process. Simply process. not just words, but actually right. tangible support. Well, yeah, you look at it. Sanders had 60, Biden had 54. Klobuchar dropped out and endorsed him, and, and in theory, her delegates now uh, go to Biden through the pledge, which is seven, which puts him at 61 or any need. Uh, or Rourke uh, endorsed him as well. And uh, Bowie Gage had uh, 26. And so, in, 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 in theory, of the world of things, uh, Biden is now ahead with potential pledged and won and potential delegates. So uh, I think it's like Sanders has 60, Biden has 54, Bootie Buttigieg had 26, Warren had 8, Klobuchar had 7, everyone else was 0. Uh, so you see how much Super Tuesday, why they call it Super Tuesday, I mean, you're talking about thousands of delegates uh, in this process. So, and you need 1,991 on the first round of a voting because the first round of voting at the Democratic National uh, get together in Milwaukee, the convention, uh, super delegates are not allowed to vote. And those super delegates uh, are who gave the winning uh, numbers to Hillary Clinton the last time around. There was a fight over pledged delegates. There was 13 delegates. Those delegates, some of them had pledged to Hillary Clinton very early on in the political process. Even though Sanders took 71 72 counties in yeah, Wisconsin, yeah, right. so 51 percent of the popular vote. Uh, there's a lot of people that thought that the delegate allocation ought to be seven to Sanders and six to Clinton based on that. And yet, uh, the majority of the delegates, I think Mark Pocahan, uh voted uh, for Sanders as an independent uh, super delegate, and uh, Mandela Barnes. Uh, now Lieutenant Governor voted for uh, Sanders, the rest of the super delegates, uh, people like Danny Baldwin and other elected officials all went with their pledge, and they had pledged prior to the pre uh, primary in Wisconsin to cast a vote on behalf. It's all, it's party politics. Yeah, it's, of course, it's it makes you question uh, what, 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 was the, what was the primary for. Well, the primary yeah. certainly is, it, it, it is a, a question. I mean, I think what's happening is is that the primary system has gone from uh, where the party bosses controlled everything in, in small internal uh, caucuses to statewide caucuses in which the party still can control it to uh, primaries and open primaries, for example, uh, in uh, 
South, uh, South Carolina, you had Republicans. There was nobody. The, the Republican Party didn't allow anyone but Donald Trump on the ticket, which is another great exercise of democracy by the Republican Party. Uh, they didn't allow anyone else on the ballot. So therefore, Republicans could move over and cast ballots. I don't know what the, the polls might show that they did, but there were Republicans who said they were going to get in that race. Typically, they would get in and vote for the person who was least likely to win. Uh, and yet, there may be some things going on that uh, that allows people to move over. Of course, independents can go to the right or left any time. They are independents. In some states, you have to pledge your party affiliation for it. Uh, state of Wisconsin, you go in and you get uh, as many ballots as there are parties, and you can only cast one ballot. So in other words, you make it five ballots, you get Democratic, uh, Republican, Green Party, Socialist Party, uh, Independents, Libertarian, and stuff like that. They'll give you a ballot for each one of them. That's the way it's going to get done in the past. Um, but one down need not be a member of a party to vote in the primary election. Not in the state of I've never joined a party, and I vote. Now this whole delegate process did, as I did it, as I recall, Paul, begin after the McGovern Nixon elections. Is that when the whole notion of super delegates began? Uh, the Democratic Party was as opposed to uh, George McGovern, no matter if he was nominated, as it does seem now, opposed to Bernie Sanders. George McGovern won only one state, Minnesota, uh, was Massachusetts. In any case, he won one state. It was an overwhelming victory by, by Nixon. We're talking about 1972. Or 1972. Yeah. 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 It was a broker convention in Chicago uh, where the battle on the floor uh, was, uh, you know, again, a, a, another situation in which you had a McCarthy uh, peace candidate. And, Inside political party, totally opposed to uh, opposed to that. Uh, you know, and, and walkouts of delegates to show the delegates. Richard Daly's police force getting increasingly violent against protesters and everything else. And there's some people that are saying that that might be the scenario for what's coming up in, in Milwaukee, Milwaukee in what July. they call a brokered convention, mm -hmm. in which uh, Sanders arrives. A handful of delegates short. Now this is just projections because I don't know where I don't know where it's going to go. I mean, it looks like it's going to be a battle between Biden and Sanders, uh, literally, with uh, Bloomberg uh, standing on his side a little bit. Uh, Warren's still in the race at this particular point, and so is uh, Tulsa Gabbard at the bottom. Tulsa of the, Gabbard, mm -hmm. right, uh, uh, running with uh, a little bit less than one percent of the popular vote. Warren at 15 percent, Bloomberg at 15 percent, Biden at 26, and Sanders at 34 percent. That's national polling. Mm -hmm. That is not the individual state by state. So you arrive to a convention a little bit short. And the question is, is what are the superdelegates going to do if there is an initial vote and you don't reach that threshold of uh, 1,991 um, uh, delegates? On the first ballot. On you first don't ballot. river on the first ballot then. Then there's another uh, 700 and some uh, delegates that are added. 771 superdelegates who get to vote on the second round. And the question is, is will they vote uh, similar to what their state uh, primary or the caucuses said? As Wisconsin, uh, they're, for they're, example. They're free. They're mm -hmm. free. What I don't see this time is what Clinton had done was to go out and get all these pledged uh, delegates way in advance, hundreds of them. In this case, uh, you know, we're seeing dozens of pledges and, and endorsements early on by some of those potential super dele delegates, but I think people learned a little bit of a lesson. They're much less um, likely to go running out and make a pledge very early on before they see where the popular vote's going. But anything can happen because, you know, some people seem to think that politics is a nice little coordinated, cordial, respectful process that takes place, and it's nothing like that. It's a huge battle. It's political power. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, in some cases, it is raw political power and warfare mentality in the heads of some individuals, which means that you will get people who will be able to um, do whatever they want including things that candidates don't want to do on their behalf because they're so they so want to win 
And uh, so that's kind of a little bit of a, a, a situation where you just want to kind of watch which what's going to take place. And I think that there's a, a there's a lot of a, there's a lot of suspicion amongst part of the Democratic political base. I I think I think that uh, the question of the integrity of the whole process is difficult to answer for people. You get out there and people says, I don't vote. I, I, it doesn't make a difference. I'm, I'm, I'm mad at the system. I don't understand how it works and so forth. And yet, uh, raw voting uh, is what's going to get your candidate uh, in place if that happens. You look at the Nevada, what happened in Nevada was Sanders taking that. You know, Sanders ran up something like 85% of everyone under the age of 29. That's a big statistic if it holds true throughout the rest of the primary, if it holds true into the presidential election, that kind of a solid vote amongst young people is a tremendous um, portion of the political power because you have so fewer people at the top, and yet the people in the ages from 50 to, to 70 are, are, you know, 95% of the time are going to go vote. On the other end, you've got about maybe a 10 or 15% turnout of uh, young people. Uh, women between the ages of 18 and 25 with children, 98% of them don't, aren't registered to vote. Isn't that something? Yeah. Now, Paul, I just heard, uh, I think it might have been yesterday or the day before, the uh, chair of the uh, White Earth Reservation uh, uh, endorsed, uh, endorsed Bernie Sanders to raucous applause from the people before whom he, before whom he was speaking, uh, the White Earth Res. Uh, well, enthusiastic Black, uh, Black de Flambeau last week endorsed uh, Trisha Zunker as a candidate, uh -huh. which uh, a lot of times tribal governments don't endorse. They pretty much let it up uh, to their citizens to cast the vote what they want. But, um, you know, there's some pretty drastic differences between uh, Zunker and Tom Tiffany on the Republican ticket here in northern Wisconsin. And people, I think, are pretty well uh, aware of that uh, environmental uh, a record of uh, state senator Tom or Tiffany. absent of well yes oh, yeah, yeah. environmental it's, 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 yeah. it's a record it's a record yeah. of lifting up moratoriums and yeah, you Tom can, Tiffany, you can right. yeah you can dump water in uh, uh, streams and wetlands and and do all kinds of things there was a, a real weakening of of the laws under uh, the legislation that he passed um, there was a real strong turnout during the primary between him and Jason Church. So we'll ask the question, what does that mean? Is yes, it a staunchly anti-Tiffany yeah. uh, vote? Because uh, people says he's got a rough uh, personality and where will those people go? Will they sit it out? Or will they move toward uh, Zunker? Um, it, it's really hard to say. What we do know is that in the 7th District, there was more money put into a congressional campaign uh, primary uh, more money than 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 ever before, but ten times. I mean, they raised, uh, you know, uh, between Tiffany and Church, a million and a half dollars to Zunker's hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. The Pros uh, Americans for Prosperity Club for Growth sent out mailers to everyone in the conservative right wing organizations yeah, on out Tiffany's out of behalf. State. Koch brother uh, funded uh, America, uh, you know the petroleum industry people. Uh, those are people who are you know it's dark money, pack money outside of the political candidates. Uh, it shows that they're concerned about the district because they've spent an awful lot of outside state money uh, to generate the turnout that they did. A friend of mine got three different flyers. Uh, telling them to vote for uh, uh, Tiffany from organizations from out of the state. In order to do that in the 7th District, it costs about $180,000 per uh, distribution of those uh, placards and postcards. They're not just regular little postcards, there's big placards. Yeah, the big ones, money. the glossy ones. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, no, I live outside so, of the, uh, uh, well, I actually live in the district. I don't know why I didn't get any mailings. Maybe they just hadn't found me yet, or they, they've narrowed well, it down and realized. Maybe, maybe you're too deep on they, one side, they just says, no, uh, wait a minute. That, we're not going to spend the nickel on you. <laughs> <laughs> it it could be, but what it does is it's, it's, it's a district that's in the eye. There's a couple reasons. I always like to promote it's Surrey County because uh, in the primary we're the indicator of who might win, except for once in a hundred years. You've heard that a lot. Yeah. Okay, so in the last uh, primary election, presidential primary, Surrey County went for Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. 
And uh, we, we, we again predicted the winner because Trump went on to win and, and uh, Clinton was nominated on the Democratic side and lost. Mm -hmm. And so I'm convinced that if you're a presidential candidate and want to win this race, you have to come to Come here to County. Kubis. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you need to come here. You need to come to Kubis. On a Tuesday this, morning. This is the balance of power right in here, right here. Um, but but it is it is important because it's one of the earlier congressional races, and even though there's a race in May, remember there's another race in November, and so I think on both sides of the aisle, people are saying, look at if it's close, uh, the race between Zunker and Tiffany uh, just keeps going through uh, the November uh, election, simply because there's not enough time to find another candidate on either ticket to really do it correctly. Now, now the numbers between them, now, uh, Jason Church, the Republican uh, primary candidate, who lost in that primary to Tom Tiffany, the state senator. Trisha Zunker running against uh, Lawrence Dale. Uh, he barely campaigned at all, um, got a smattering of votes, was easily defeated uh, by, uh, by Trisha Zunker. But the margin between the Republican ballots and the Democratic ballots is virtually two to one. Twice as many Republicans voted right. as Democrats. But, what, but is, divide, what does that mean? Anything? Well, $1.5 million against 150,000. Okay. Uh, so the general said, election? So when you look prime, at the general the election, May 12th, the question I mean, is, are there any more Republicans? And if you look at the 216 presidential election, I think it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump won Wisconsin by 23,000 votes. The total number of Republican votes was less than what Romney got four years earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Trump got less. The trouble is, is there was about 280,000 less votes on the Democratic uh, t ticket for Hillary Clinton, which simply means Democrats didn't uh, turn out. The question is, is are all those voters, new voters and different voters that have migrated out of the Democratic ticket to the Republican side in the primary, but take 1.5 million and divide it into the number of votes, take 150,000 divided into the number of votes that Trisha Zenker and ask the question, how much did each political party or candidate pay to turn their people out? Are there any more Republicans in the 7th District than there was four years ago or two years ago during the congressional election? No, they did, they did better. And I think the statistics uh, bear that out here. Uh, let's just take a look at uh, the 7th District uh, turnout was 9.1%. Uh, Milwaukee had a 4.9% turnout. Wisconsin uh, total was 37 but if you eliminate Milwaukee in the 7th Congressional di District, it was a 2.3% turnout in the primary mm -hmm. election. Very, very low. It's in the middle of February. It's in the middle of the winter. So... I just like the idea that in the 7th Congressional District, uh, the turnout was 9.1%, uh, record-breaking. In some places, let's look at Sawyer County. We had a 13% turnout in Sawyer County, whereas the rest of the state, 3.7%. Uh, and uh, what's interesting about this is, is that on the Democratic ticket, uh, the turnout was 108% better than the primary in 2016, okay? Uh, in fact, well, 108% is like you're doubling the numbers. But the Republican turnout in Sawyer County was 172%. Mm. See, there's not any more Republicans in Sawyer County. They just did a better job I'm of turning out uh, with all. The, yeah, and then if you're going to spend a million dollars turning out people, people better turn out, I would say, because if we had spent a million dollars on the Zunker side, I think we, it probably would have evened up a little bit. This is an exciting race. Trump took it by 20 points. Uh, the seventh district. In the seventh district. So you want to look at the margins between Zunker and Tiffany in the final. Uh, election, because if that 20% margin is shrinking, it may mean that Trump is losing a little bit of that margin. The polls are saying that it isn't, but if it is eroded to 16% in the 7th district, 7th congressional district, a staunch supporter, Trump loses Wisconsin just statistically by looking at what's happening in the rest of the state. Um, and a lot of people sat out 2016 because they thought Bernie got burned in the process and they didn't vote. It's not that they weren't there. They, uh, they just decided not to vote because they didn't, or they cast it for a third third party ballot. Well, we wonder what will happen this time because some of the same dynamic seems to be at work in the presidential campaign and much uh, the Democratic nomination campaign. And uh, much will be will be learned. Well, if we can learn, 
Uh, today, at the conclusion of this uh, Super Tuesday primary, 14 elections uh, nation, nationwide. Now, this is a, we talk about the Zunker uh, uh, Tom Tiffany race. It's May 12th. Is the election? Um, yes, it is. So we got actually two things I mean, that are coming up. It could be a little confusing for folks. Oh, We've it, got it, the 18th of February, May 12th, April 7th, and then, of course, November 3rd. Well, and there's something in August as well. There's a primary. Oh, that's uh, right. Uh, it's got to <laughs> narrow things down at the local election and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, we've got the uh, Tuesday, April 7th, which is the presidential preferences. That's our primary. Our the primary, Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Open, open you come primary. In, you don't have to declare a party, but you only get to cast uh, one, one ticket out of whatever they uh, give you in the primary. Judicial races, Supreme Court uh, final uh, tally. That's right. Uh, Joe Kurowski running yeah. against uh, Daniel Kelly. A Republican Kelly, oh, well, excuse me, nonpartisan. No, he was widely supported, heavily supported by the very commercial and uh, conservative interests in this state. Very open about it. Very yeah. open about it. There <laughs> seems to be no secret any longer that uh, that uh, judges at Supreme Court level and likely below that have uh, have some political uh, leaning and partisanship. And I guess we might as well know it at the outset. Yeah, uh, county elections. Uh, town elections, school board elections. We have uh, tribal members uh, uh, in Soria County running for all of those positions, town board positions, county board supervisor positions, and uh, school board positions. So mm -hmm. um, I know uh, the Lacoudere tribe, just like some of the other tribes, is now just beginning to launch um, a GOTV, get out the vote. Um, they want to register their votes. They don't want to uh, tell you what political party to vote for, but they may make some suggestions like some of the tribes are, but the more, uh, uh, the bigger important uh, picture is is that you get the tribal electric involved in um, uh, electing uh, local officials. There are so many jurisdictional issues, budgetary uh, issues, policy issues that are made at the town and county level that it's important that uh, tribal uh, individuals be involved in that process to bring some balance to the perspectives that are given there at times, which uh, sometimes the most erroneous picture of what the tribe or the county is doing is at the local level between the tribe and uh, local officials. Mm -hmm. So it's important to do that. And then you've got the Tuesday, May 12th, uh, special general congressional district election. And uh, when that's done and over with, uh, they have to start running for November again. Isn't all over that something? Again. Yeah. yeah, begin it's again. Be it's because Duffy uh, resigned at a really uh, odd time uh, last August or something like that. Um, too far away not to fill the seat, and uh, too close to, uh, to to appoint someone. I don't. I don't think. I don't yeah, even know. There were some, yeah, there were a number of uh, date uh, calendar restrictions which uh, forced this uh, the primary to have been February 18th, and then this special general on May the 12th, and then, as you say. They run again. Whomever will run again on um, for the November November election. Uh, Paul, I, I would I would be remiss if I didn't uh, bring up the fact that uh, last time we saw each other, I believe, was up in Ashland at the Bohemian Hall there, and there recognizing and and a gathering to uh, note the passing and honor of a man who many felt was the poet laureate of the Pinocchies, uh, Rob Rob Ganson. Absolutely. Yeah. That was a, uh, a very interesting guy that had interesting uh, roots uh, in this region and area. Uh, was good friends with the uh, Joker Corbine, the late Joker Corbine, and a, a Vietnam vet. Um, he was involved years ago in the protest against Project ALF. We saw him at uh, environmental uh, activists actions uh, anywhere in the Bayfield, Chiquamigan uh, district. He certainly stood with uh, Bad River and other people. His uh, stepchildren were members of this tribe here. And uh, so um, it, it was a great honor to, to have uh, met this guy. He did you know, poetry by music with music in the background and everything else staunch supporter of uh, clean uh, water rights and uh, not afraid to get in your face. I mean, he went up into the Pinocchies when uh, um, this security firm uh, was up there with the AR-15s and machine guns and, and camouflage locked, up to him, locked up to him into the Pinocchies and says, you know, what the hell are you doing up on land open to the public, you know, and uh, one of the, you know, the guy had his fingers on the machine gun and his finger on the trigger and was pointing it at his wife and uh, 
this is this is about the time when Rob said, "Look at you know, <laughs> you, you you got a pretty short period of time standing there doing that in any way." You know, um, it was a confrontation, but there was pictures taken of that, and they went viral he, all over the he world. Yeah, he took the well, photo. He didn't, I don't think he took the the photo. I think someone else was with mm -hmm. him. Maybe he did, mm -hmm. but uh, the photo went viral. This is a man with an AR-15 and full camouflage. Uh, Protecting, uh, defending, uh, pointing a gun at uh, people the body for the hiking in the woods. Night, yeah. in, in land that was open to the public yeah. at that time, uh, over a mine, and and you hear about this in third world countries even today. Indigenous leaders being slain in opposition to mining operations. Opposition but, uh, to or protecting things. Trigger yes. finger, an accident, anything could have led to a, a, a tragedy uh, in this situation. But Rob uh, stood tall. Uh, through all of this, and so uh, very independent, you know. I mean, there's a, a lot of people in this district that are very independent. They're not Republicans, they're not Democrats. I'm not even sure if they would call themselves independents. They says, I, I'm not going to tell you if I'm independent, I'm not going to tell you if I'm anything. Mm -hmm. I'm liberated, you know. And when they get in the poll, when they do decide uh, to vote, uh, you know, it'll be. Um, you know, I, I think that's the best way to exercise your preference about what's going on. I and mean, we've got a lot of issues coming up here in the near future. We got a lot of discussions. You know, this whole idea that some candidates are socialists when most people have no idea what's what socialism means in the real world of uh, co-ops and co you know cooperatives and uh, streets and highways well, you know, and yeah. schools and bridges. So Harry S. Truman talking about uh, socialism is public power, social security, price supports, bank deposits, insurance, roadways, uh, independent labor organizations, all kinds of things that are pretty decent. It's not communism and it's not government control of everything, but it's redistribution of the money in a way, for example, uh, taking a trillion dollars or so out of the military budget and putting it into health care or public education so it's affordable. It doesn't necessarily Necessarily always turn into more taxes. It could, but the idea is, is that by streamlining public services, you should make them more efficient, which they are at times, uh, compared to the profit-making uh, capabilities of corporations. Who, for example, in drugs, up until the 19, I think 19. 60s or something, it was illegal to make profit off of health care yes. uh, categories. Yeah, isn't that you amazing? And, and Harry Truman was calling for national health insurance back in 1950. Right, right. It was illegal to make a profit off of it. Now, nowadays, uh, people can take a pill that they can manufacture for a dollar, and if it's in high demand, charge $100 or $1,000 if you get it at the hospital emergency room, and it'll cost you $1,000. But everyone in the health care realm is making good money. And, uh, you know, the privatization of things uh, simply turns uh, entities into profit-making spheres and less likely better services and uh, treatment to the patients and everything else. And that's, that's my opinion about it. So when someone says, oh, if someone like a socialist gets, you know, like a democratic socialist like Sanders gets elected, I'm going to argue that, look at... Um, He's got to still go through Congress in the Senate. He's not the big boogeyman. He wants to redistribute the money in different ways. But just because someone says, free this, doesn't mean it's going to be taken out of your pocketbook. There's a lot of things that have to take place before that can happen. And uh, I, I think you see it with Trump, you know, deciding to do certain things in the courts or legislation acts uh, preventing him from doing it. So there's got to be balancing of power. But when you look at some of the... You know, here, here's the budget, you know, 31% reduction in the Trump budget in Environmental Protection Agency. Trump's croning about how, you know, we prevented the coronavirus and nobody's died. Well, now there's six deaths, you know, and you can build that wall as high as you want in Mexico. They defunded the office that dealt with pandemic coordination in the United States and diverted the money to build a wall. And so that's supposed to protect us from <laughs> these little bugs coming across the border. Uh, we need to look at some of this stuff and uh, ask what what are the priorities. It's not always tax breaks for the rich and uh, for the corporations. It is public services to the people. Um, so, anyway, there's plenty that we we could have talked for an hour. But Eric, thanks for having we me. Could, in. I'll we slow could slow down do for that. a minute or two. <laughs> <laughs> good. Wisconsin has 97 delegates coming up on April 7th. Watch what happens in Minnesota. Look at the end of the day. Uh, the number of candidates may even be less tomorrow morning. It may be. Paul Domain, thank you very much. Good to have you here. Appreciate Thank it. You, Eric. Thank you. We have uh, Democracy Now! It is in just a moment here.
on WOJB, WOJB Reserve, Wisconsin, broadcasting from the Couture on the web, WOJB.org. Uh, we expect a high temperature today of about 39 degrees, and it's going to remain cloudy tomorrow. Sunshine in a high of 39 degrees.